So anyway, what I'm going to talk about today is three sections. Hopefully at least one of them will resonate with you. The first thing is how to lead change. So hopefully I'll give you a few tips and tricks if you're at the start of your leadership career or if you, you really you know, have something you're passionate about that you're trying to drive in your talent function, how can you go about achieving that change? The second thing is if you've actually got the change on the agenda within your organisation, what's the best way to manage it? Um, and then finally, if you are an individual and you've kind of had change thrust upon you um, may, and you may be not too happy about it or you're not sure whether you're happy about it, what are some survival tips to get through that change? Okay. So firstly, how to drive change. So this is kind of what I do as a career now. I actually, I wouldn't call myself a recruiter anymore. I tend to have teams of recruiters. Um, but shock horror, I, I'm actually not that good at LinkedIn, for example. My LinkedIn profile's not that great. Um, my, my team constantly tease me about that. Um, but what I do, do, what I do know how to do is, is drive change. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was developing a business case. And I've heard a few times today the phrase, there was no budget. So I'll tell you a little trick that I've learned. There is almost always budget. You just need to know how to get your hands on it. Um, so, a couple of tips there, and I, I more than welcome you to find my very bad LinkedIn profile and contact me for a chat any time about this. Um, but some really simple tricks. Firstly, start with a problem statement that will actually solve a, biz a really, you know, key problem in the business. So, you know, what is the business problem? So, you might be really passionate about a piece of technology and you just can't understand why you know, some people in the business share your passion, well, get beyond the roots of why you're passionate about that piece of technology. You know you're passionate, but really understand why you're passionate. Inadvertently, you know it's going to solve a problem. You need to learn how to articulate that problem. Okay, I've also heard data mentioned today. Data will be your best friend with business people, especially senior leaders. Data and numbers talk. So if you can put together a business case around that technology that I just mentioned to show either that you're going to save money or you're going to solve a talent shortage or you're going to make the noise go away. So sometimes noise in the business and angry hiring managers can be your best friend for your business case. You actually want them to make more noise sometimes. You want to make them so much... To, you want them to make so much noise that at the right moment you can step in and say... I can make the noise go away, okay? So um, data will be your best friend. And what I've really found is use your... Sorry, suppliers in the room. Um, use your suppliers. Your suppliers quite often have developed business cases as part of their sales pitch. So use your supply... Be friends with your suppliers and get them to help you put business cases together. Who is already using this technology and has some wins that you will be able to share back to the business? So use your data and build your business case. And the return on investment won't always be dollars. It doesn't always have to be cost savings. So, you know, 10 or 12 years ago when I f first started doing this, it was always about cost savings. What I'm increasingly finding is business cases are now about value and, you know, solving different problems. Thankfully, recruitment is not just about cutting out recruitment agency spend anymore. So, you know, sometimes that's, that's still an argument, but find the value argument. Okay, know the levers. So, sometimes it's really hard when you don't have a seat at the senior leadership table to know what's on the agenda and what, what, what is topical at the moment. But what I've discovered is... Um, Almost every senior leadership meeting I go into, there's, there's something new that's topical. And it's not always what's in the business strategy and what might seem obvious to you. It might just be what, what problems cropped up in the media today. Um, and so if you know the levers and what's topical with your senior leadership group at the moment, that can be really helpful for you to hone in and get their attention with your business case. Um, be aware of other agendas. So one thing I learned early on was even when I had a really compelling business case and it's like, no-brainer, man, um, 
Sometimes there are other things going on politically in, in the company that just mean they are not ready to hear what you've got to say or they've, they, they need to spend money on something else and, and it's, it's just not right. Um, find the right sponsor. So quite often if you don't have the seat at the table, you need to get in the ear of somebody. Oh, that's good. I've, I've given someone something. She's writing it down. Excellent. Um, you, you need to get someone who has a seat at the table and ideally a really big voice at the table to back you. Um, so if you're ever recruiting for the CFO, they're the one I'd go for, um, or a, um, an operations, a chief operations manager or a general manager of operations, anyone that has a really sort of high profi profile or critical segment or area of the business can be your best sponsor. Um, and either you or your team are going to be recruiting for those people at that time, at, at some time, sorry. So that's your chance is to get, you know, get in their face and just say, hey, I've got this idea. Or, you know, do you agree with me that this is a bit of a problem for our business? So if you can get them to sponsor you at the table or even better take you to the table with your business case, that, that's a great thing. Um, engage in point, important others. So obviously um, finding the right sponsor is really good, but the more sponsors you can find or the more advocates you can find, the better. And, you know, I referred to the noise before. So early in my career, I was afraid of noise because we're always told, you know, please the hiring manager, make the noise go away. We don't want escalations, all of that kind of stuff. I now tell my team when, I, when I'm trying to drive a business case, create noise. If it's a problem, I don't care if you stuff up um, because you want the advocates. So, and, and the more, you know, we all have people in our businesses who are really painful um, and have, have sort of disproportionate power, um, not by their position or their level, but just because they're annoying and, and loud, you, you kind of want them to be, you know, your, your sponsors as well. Um, Co-design. So a big lesson I learned, again, you know, you can have a no-brainer business case, um, but if key people in the organisation don't feel they're involved, in coming up with the solution, then sometimes you're just gonna have no chance because of politics. And you know, it's a bit like I mentioned before about having change thrust upon you. Sometimes when organisations have new things thrust upon them, um, they're just not gonna engage with it no matter how good it is for them individually or, or, or the business. So where you can, and again, those noisy, annoying people, if you can get them on board to help you design whatever solution you, you're providing, really good good thing to ensure your success and your buy-in. And that, you know, th those hard ones to win over, they're the ones that will actually go out and again, being noisy, actually tell everyone, hey, look how great I am, look what I did. It was really you, but you know, you made it their idea. Um, be courageous and passionate. So driving change is not easy. Being a recruiter is damn hard. You know, really, really hard. It requires so much resilience and tenacity. And I, I found driving change is a whole new level of that. Um, you need to work at it and work at it and work at it and you just can't give up your passion. Um, and, you know, sometimes you don't get the sponsorship straight away and you don't get the timing straight away, but you've just got to keep going at it and kind of take the knocks um, until you, you get the win. Finalising that, you do need to know when to walk away. Um, so I've, I've had um, some pieces of work, particularly when I was consulting a few years back, where I went in and I worked for months on a business case um, only to get to the end and it was just the wrong timing. It just was never going to fly at that time. So you do, you know, despite your courage and your passion, you do need to know when to walk away and probably just leave it in the hands of someone else for a different time. Okay. So let's imagine you've, you've gone hard, you've been courageous and passionate and you've got your sponsorship and you've got, a, you've got your seat at the table and the executive team has given you $2 million for a new technology suite or, or, or whatever it may be, employer branding, whatever it may be. How do you actually lead and manage the change through the organisation? So firstly, you need to have a really clear plan. 
So, you know, you can't just do stuff. You, you, you really need to plan it out. And probably biggest learning I can share is you need to have fat in your plan because whatever you think it's going to take, it's going to take at least twice as long um, for various reasons. You know, implementing technology, there might be stuff-ups with the testing. Employer branding, your creative agency might be a real pain um, and the concepts they present to you just might not be right until iteration number 10. Um, so it will always take longer. Be agile though, so don't, you know, be dogged with the plan. Make sure you do revise it if you need to um, because things do happen along the way. You know, there might suddenly be a freeze on something and the budget you thought you had is, is frozen for three months or, you know, you, the creative agency you were working with um, might suddenly be in the press with, you know, some, some stuff up they've done somewhere and it's no longer ethical for you to work with them, etc. So, so you need to be agile. Ensure you have the right resources and ensure you have enough resources. So um, there is no better way to fail um, than, you know, not... And you guys know this. This is, this is what we do. You've got to have the right people um, to actually deliver what you need. Uh, what else? Design best, best fit, not best practice. So I'm going to be honest, I'm not a fan of best practice. Um, I do like to watch the industry and come to these kind of events and, you know, absolutely learn what everyone else is doing. But I think um, what I've discovered is there is no worse thing you can do than completely copy what someone else is doing. Um, you really need to learn from them and learn to assess your own situation and what, it, what is best fit for your organisation. You know, so for example, I loved the EY um, presentation earlier and I was writing, a, well done ladies, um, and I was writing a few notes, but I was also thinking, ah, oh, yeah, that would work for me at transport, that this would not work for me, etc. And I think that's really important too. And there's no sure way to fail than put something in that's not right for your organisation because you'll just, you'll just lose credibility and you'll, you'll never get another business case over the line. Um, keep all of the stakeholders in your sight right from the moment you started the business case right through to the end. And what can happen is once you've been given, you know, your project to run, you can get so absorbed in the doing of the project that you can forget about engaging all of the people along the way with how you're going, when's the change coming, what's going to happen, what are the impacts on them. I would say that communication, communication along the way is equally as important as the delivery of the outcome. Um, because what can happen is you can go so hard delivering, you know, working behind the scenes on your project and then come out and go, ta-da! Um, and if the organisation's not ready for you and they've forgotten that they were on board six months ago, but now actually they're not that interested, that can be a real problem for you in terms of getting their engagement um, and they, that you might find they're nowhere near as excited as you. Um, don't rush. This is, you know, a bit the same as the resources thing. You, you know, the organisation more than likely will want you to deliver something quickly once they're excited, um, but it is the quality of the outcome um, that counts that really counts and this is again where the courage needs to come in so you really need to be bold and think through the pace that you need to work out to deliver the best outcome and sort of stand up for yourself and your function and your project when the organisation is pushing you to deliver more quickly. Um, don't soft launch. This was a really, really hard lesson that I learned um, about seven or eight years ago um, when I was working on a... a um, project for a global retailer. Um, you, going back to what I was saying about engaging the organisation, if you soft launch and no one knows what you're doing, no one cares. Really, no one cares and you just won't have the impact um, that you need to have. Um, get some quick wins. So, you know, if you can, sort of as you're going through the project development, if there are some things you can do before you even go live, um, do them. And, you know, then you will get buy even more buy-in and credibility from the organisation and su have them super excited f for when you deliver the big thing. Um, and then finally, over-communicate. So, I'm going to share a story with you that's just happened in, in my, um, my current 
um, organisation. So I, I've just joined, um, I've just moved back from, um, back to Sydney from Melbourne and I'm, I'm working for Transport for New South Wales doing a massive talent transformation there. I've got a team of 106 that um, are all starting on Tuesday. <laughs> so I need to rush back tonight and get ready for that. Um, but... I, when I started six months ago, my very first presentation, um, I, I said to them, we will not be doing RPO. I, 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 we had already agreed that before I started. Um, so I said that then, and probably about five or six times over the past six months, I've repeated, we will not be doing RPO. Um, I overheard a water cooler, literally a water cooler conversation a couple of weeks ago. Um, a couple of my team members didn't know I was around the corner at the printer. And um, they were actually saying, oh, you know they're going to do RPO. <laughs> and I popped my head around the corner and I said, didn't I say we're not doing RPO? But I, I, this is the thing. Even though I've said it five or six times, that's not enough. For some people, until they see it or really hear it over and over and over again, they don't believe it. So, you know, I, that was a real learning for me of sometimes you almost need to over-communicate the key messages um, until you're really sick of the sound of your own voice. <laughs> okay, so finally, how to survive change. Um, and this is more of an individual um, thing. And, you know, so some of you may not be in a position to, to lead change, drive business cases, etc. But absolutely all of you at some point will have to survive through change. And sometimes you'll be on board with it and sometimes you won't. Um, probably one of the, the hardest things that I've found as a leader is how to support my people through change. Um, because you know, as I mentioned to you for a start, I don't struggle with change. I, I like it. Um, so, firstly, from an empathetic perspective, it's hard for me to understand that people struggle with it. Um, but I do find that the majority of people do struggle with change. And what's really interesting is people do tend to be, I hate to say, their worst and most exaggerated selves through change. So, if people are gossips, they're extreme gossips during change. If people are pessimists, they're, you know, extremely pessimistic. If they're, um, if they, they suffer from slight depression, they, they suffer, re suffer really extreme um, depression. If they're nurturers, um, on a positive note, they become extremely nurturing um, through change. So, the tips that I wanted to um, share with you today from a personal perspective is firstly just to be aware of change and the fact that you probably won't quite be your real self or, or you'll be an extreme version of not your best self and, and some tips to manage that. Um, so firstly, don't be a sheep. So the biggest thing that I notice is, um, so do you all notice when you go to a car park, we just, you know, let's say there's three exit gates. Do you notice that just naturally we don't think about it and we all follow the other cars and sometimes there's a bank up at one gate and there's, there's two gates free. I don't know if you've all noticed that but I, I, I always notice that. I find the same thing with change. Everyone just kind of tends to jump on a bandwagon. If, if there's gossip, they'll gossip about something or if they'll react in a certain way, they'll all do it, etc. So I would advise you, be, you know, be yourself and make your own decisions um, and just be really conscious of what's going on and what it, how everyone else is behaving. Um, understand the change. So um, let's be honest, a lot of change is not good. Um, I always say the workplace is just like school. There are a lot of dickheads at school and there's a lot of dickheads at work, okay? Um, so change is not always a good thing. Um, and, and sometimes bad leaders make bad decisions. And, and I've even, I'll be honest, I've even probably made a few bad decisions too. Um, but do your best to understand, you know, where the change is coming from and why it's going on. And then you can, you know, kind of make your own mind up a, a, about where things are at. Understand the change cycle. So, um, I'm not for sure how many of you start at, studied HR or organisational psychology, etc. But if you can get your head around the different um, emotions um, that you are likely to go through, you know, sometimes in the same day you'll be angry, um, sad, confused, etc. So, I think just understanding the emotions you're likely to go through will help you recognise them. Um, 
so obviously to recognise them you need to be self-aware. Um, so I think really just doing some self-assessment of what's going on and how you're feeling um, and recognising where you're at can be really helpful. Um, don't make assumptions. So this is kind of linked to being the sheep. Um, I, I do find that people make a lot of assumptions rather than seeking to understand the truth. Um, and that can be really hard in, in organisations and environments where, where the change is secretive and, you know, they're deliberately not telling you the truth. I get that. But, but do your best to really understand the reasons for the change. And what, and what the real deal situation is, because sometimes it's not, it's not obvious, it's um, superficially what, what appears to be the, the reality is, is not actually the reality. Don't be a victim. Um, so every single one of you is employable. We all have choices. Um, if you don't like what's going on around you, you know, rather than carrying on like a pork chop and a child, just get the hell out of there. You know, I'm sure you're all approached on LinkedIn, you know, a couple of times a week. Um, if not, you you well connected. So, you know, don't be a victim. And then manage what's in your control. So, a lot of, you know, change is usually thrust upon us. You know, that's when we work for large corporates, particularly, or even medium-sized organisations, it is thrust upon us a lot of the time. I've had it happen to me too, and it sucks. Um, but just recognise, you, you only have your own sort of circle of control and, and recognise that and manage what's in your control and just don't even try, you know, try to manage what's outside of your control. Um, so accept what is not in your control once you've identified that and make your decisions. You know, you're going to stick around and see what actually, how this actually ends up and if you are going to stick around, you're going to try and be positive and just suck it up um, or you, you, can you see the writing on the wall and you, you think, you know, there's people you're working for a pack of idiots and they've got it wrong, you know, then, then find someone else who, who is getting it right and, and move on. Um, that's a wrap. I hope um, you've got something out of that. Um, I absolutely love what we do. Um, I love that our industry is changing and evolving. I think it's really exciting. It creates career opportunities for all of us and um, I'd love to have a drink with you later on. Cheers.